First of all, just on the behalf of Gail and the family, the staff, the leadership here, and we just thank you all for coming. And as we reflect and remember uh, this evening and what Steve meant to it, specifically in the light of our Lord Jesus, let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight and with incredible gratitude and a love for you, and for who you are and what you do and how you've done it. And Lord, on how wonderfully we can just share tonight in your glory, in your love, in your work, in your hope, in your peace, and in your presence. And we ask right from the beginning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come and would abide with us. Lord, may this be an evening that gives you the glory that you've earned so incredibly well beyond our dreams of earning anything. The way you love not just Steve, but all of us, the way you've loved us through him. And Lord, as we reflect on him and what he means to us, Lord, we realize behind all of that is what you meant to him. And so, Lord, we ask that tonight we, we thank you for giving us your son the hope of redemption, the life, bringing us into the body of Christ, helping us grow and mature and having meaningful lives. And Lord, as we reflect on Steve and that life that you took and how you raised him up and what you did within him and all that he meant to us, whether as a husband or a father, a grandfather, a friend, a leader, a pastor, or as a dear brother in Christ, Lord, we just ask that tonight you would lead and guide in this time, that your presence would fill us. Lord, we pray for comfort for Gail and the family and the entire body. We pray for your peace just to abide. And Lord, the joy that there is in heaven. Lord, that how blessed it is in the eyes of the Lord, the death of one of your saints, that when the work is done, and Father, you call them home. And so, Lord, there are so many mixed feelings. And we ask tonight as we share, as we worship, that you would lead and guide this time, that your hand would be upon each and every one. We just commit it now to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's stand and let's worship the Lord tonight. He is risen, amen. And because Christ is wisdom, We'll rise one day like our pastor did.
singing and shouting the truth of God tonight. You are a strong God, and Lord, I know that's what the family's depending on tonight. And we as a church family, we're depending on God. We're depending on your promises, Lord, so thank you for them. Lord, use every speaker tonight, every song that's sung, every tear, Lord, all for the glory of God and to bring honor to our pastor, father, shepherd, husband, friend pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Once again, good evening. And uh, my name is Don McClure. I've had the incredible benefit of calling Steve Mays, one of the dearest friends a man can have for over 40 years. And uh, kind of asked to MC a little bit tonight somewhat, but to give you an idea of the plan, First of all, as you know, Steve, I not only pastored here, but was a part of obviously a huge movement of which he was in from the beginning. And the list of people that could be sharing and would love to share is endless. There's many, many pastors and their wives that have come from all over the country to be here tonight. But we have a number that are going to share a little bit and then both by DVD or by video and here as well. And in the interest of time, we aren't going to be getting up and introducing each one. There'll be a little screen on to explain who they are. But just to kind of have a night of wanting to reflect on the Lord, what he gave us in the wonderful gift of Steve, what he meant to us, different reflections in his life and the way the Lord used him in our lives and friendships out of it. And uh, so it's going to just be kind of an evening for a while of just running around back and forth, uh, sharing a little bit. There's a few letters to be read and some DVDs. So that's what we're going to be doing. And then we'll have some worship and uh, then a brief message. At this time, though, it's going to begin with Skip Heitzig. We're just going to go down the row here. Skip completely blew that. And... Uh, <laughs> Hey, we're, we're ministry of grace. We, we're forgiving one another. So we have a DVD first. That, so it's, it's a good thing I stopped him in time or we could have got off to a bad start. So.
My name is uh, Raul Reese, and I'm here to tell you a story about Steve Mays. I first met Steve, uh, I think it was 1969, maybe, 1970, somewhere around there. <clears throat> I was driving to the beach. I lived in Huntington Beach. I was driving to the beach, and there were some kids that were hitchhiking, so I picked them up. And later, uh, they ended up getting saved at Calvary, and I ended up getting saved at Calvary. They wanted to go see uh, a friend of theirs that they could buy some pot from or something, marijuana, marijuana, I think they called it in those days. They go over to this house, and um, I forget the, the exact place, but it wasn't too far out of Huntington Beach, maybe Fountain Valley. And I said, well, I'll wait here in the car. I don't want to get in any trouble. I said, no, come on in. So I go in, and the guy that's selling the stuff is in a back bedroom. And I go in there, and he's in bed and has these huge pillows everywhere. And there's tapestries of uh, paisley designs that were hep in the 60s. And the walls were, you know, like you're in India or something, and the hanging curtains. I wasn't sure if it was Jabba the Hutt or who it was, but it ends up being a guy named Steve Mays. I think at that time he was in bed in the middle of the day because he had been shot in some sort of a deal in the leg. <clears throat> and I th his hair was radical. Uh, his beard and everything was radical. He looked like your proverbial biker drug dealer. And I said hi to him and didn't want to do any business with him, but nevertheless, he uh, got to know me as soon as we got at Calvary and saw each other at the services. Uh, excuse me, there's a phone call here. Just like, it might be Ral. It is Ral, he wants me to stop talking. <laughs> uh, so Steve and I met each other at Calvary Chapel. We had both become Christians in <clears throat> 1970, first part of the year in the spring. And uh, we became best of friends. At the time, about two years later, I was a director of Maranatha Music, and I tried to have a communal house for the musicians to try to teach them discipline and working as a team, that kind of thing. I learned that being at the Mansion Messiah. So we found this old two-story, like eight or ten bedroom house in Fountain Valley. And um, it didn't work out for the musicians, but Gail and Steve Mays moved in, and it was called the House of Psalms, and um, did a fantastic job there. Of all the people I've known, I've only known one Steve Mays. He's special. He's really special now. He left me with an aching back, and he's got a whole new body, and we're going to see him soon. And uh, I'm not sure if there are cars in heaven or not, but he's probably already teamed up with Chuck Smith, and he's fixing a chariot or, I don't know, something. Those two like working together. I thank the Lord for Steve because in my early days in San Diego, never felt that I was a pastor. <clears throat> I really leaned towards being a, an evangelist. And uh, Steve would drive down with me, the uh, two hours up and back and come to some of the Bible studies. And when it came down to the final Sunday of who was going to be the pastor, two other guys that uh, were driving back and forth doing a, a, a home study that I was asked to take over, uh, Steve said, Mike's anointed and you guys should help him. And that's how I ended up being the pastor in San Diego. So I owe that to Steve. And I think his loyalty as a friend is superb. He was a true friend, um, and he was uh, very transparent. When he was hurting, he would open up his heart and let people minister to him. So I miss him. I missed him the moment I heard that he'd gone to heaven. But knowing the pain he has been in and uh, understanding that pain, uh, I'm happy for him, as I know everyone else is. So, Gail, I told the story about Jabba the Hutt. I hope I did well. Hi, I'm Orville Stanton. Uh, Gail asked me to share about um, how I met Steve. It was back in the uh, early 70s. I was living in Mansion Messiah, a house connected with Calvary Chapel. Steve came to the door one night and I met him there. And I asked him if he uh, knew Jesus Christ and he said he didn't. And I asked him if he wanted to receive Christ and he did. So I led him in the sinner's prayer and he received Christ. And we, st we lived together for the next six months in that house and grew together and, and watching God transformed our life. It was a great time. We've kind of drifted apart after that, but over the years we stayed in touch. And I was always uh, admired his ministry, what God was doing with him, especially his heart for people uh, on the street. He, anybody that uh, 
came to him, he would share Christ, and that he, that in a very personal and uh, way that uh, always touched my heart, uh, he never forgot where he came from and, uh, and how important Christ is to him and to others. Uh, reflecting back on, uh, on all of this, I, 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 was, I was reminded that how important it is that we should share Jesus Christ with everybody we have opportunity to. You never know who you're talking to. He might even be a Steve Mays. Thank you for letting me share. I just want to get permission from Don McClure. As somebody once said, when you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. But live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Steve lived that kind of a life. And we've all shed lots of tears knowing that Steve left us. But I want to reflect on when I first met him and then one other uh, instance besides. I met Steve in 1973 when Steve was shepherding, pastoring one of the communes, actually a couple of them uh, over that uh, two-year period, one at the Macedonia House and then the other the House of Psalms. What drew me to Steve was he had a crazy side. He had an edge to him and he was a biker. And my brother, who rode with the Hells Angels and was just as mean as all get out, when I saw Steve, I thought, there's hope. <laughs> Look what God can do in that life. He could do it in my brother's life. Over the years, uh, Steve and I shared um, uh, lots of activities, and we spoke at each other's churches. And uh, we rode some motorcycles together when he was out visiting in New Mexico. But one of the things I remember about Steve is his love for the Word. Everybody in this church knows that. His love to preach, uh, love to, uh, uh, to teach and to preach the Bible. And he always wanted to get as good at doing that as possible. So he called me up one time and invited me to go to a convention on biblical exposition in Texas. So we attended that a couple of times. And I just remember his hunger and thirst to be faithful to the Lord as a godly and gifted pastor and teacher. The second uh, memory that I have of Steve was here at South Bay. Uh, before Steve even came to this church, I was friends with the founding pastor. In fact, uh, I was in Israel living on a kibbutz for a couple of months with that pastor who had left here just for a sabbatical, just to get his heart closer to the Lord and work out some issues. Well, when we came back to the States, that pastor left this flock and they were, you were, this church was looking for a, a new shepherd, a new leader. I was doing the youth group at the time. I was teaching a Friday night Bible study here way, way back. And a couple of board members even suggested, uh, they said, Skip, we're going to um, suggest you as the senior pastor of this church. I thought, you got to be kidding. Um, I know nothing about pastoring. I know nothing about ministry. I have a medical background. I'm in my 20s. I'm a surfer in Huntington Beach. I can't do this. <laughs> this is not up my alley. But then I remember the night that Don McClure brought Steve Mays and introduced him to the leadership and to the church. And I had known Steve from the house ministries. And if you know anything about those early commune days, you got a lot of shifty characters going through those communes. <laughs> and Steve knew how to handle them. And so when Steve came in to teach, and just with his background in leadership, it, it, it felt like this, ah, oh, that's the right fit. He's the right guy for that. And um, the night that Steve was, was commissioned by the board to pastor this church, he said something that told us about the level of commitment he had to this flock. He turned to the board and he said, I'll die here. He said, I will never leave this church. And just the, the chills that sent down our spine, here's a man who is totally committing his life to a flock to make sure that they are strong in the word. Well, I was here just a short time before I left to New Mexico, but I, I brought a Bible with me. It was the Bible I had back then. And I was sitting in this church, it was a different facility, but 
Steve gave a message and I, I wrote a note down. It was so profound. He was talking about fellowship and abiding in Christ. And it's still in the back of my Bible. Steve May said, the law of fellowship is that we and God hold nothing back. And I thought, boy, that is profound. If you have a relationship with someone and it's an intimate relationship, you hold nothing back. The law of fellowship is that you hold nothing back. Well, Steve held nothing back. In his love for the Lord, he held nothing back. In his love for this church and his commitment to this church, and Jesus Christ held nothing back from Steve Mays. The blessings he gave him here on earth, but then to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I hate following tall people. I was 165, but I felt proud and arrogant, so. <laughs> Skip was telling me in the back room about that statement that Steve made when he talked to the board and he said, he made such a commitment, he, you know, I will die here. I, he should have said, I'll die at 80 here, but he just said, I'll die here, so. <laughs> anyway, I've been asked to read, as you know, the Calvary Chapel of South Bay was involved in ministry around the world, not just here. And Steve had built relationships, some of which are here on the platform with us, outside of the fellowship here and other ministries all around. And a couple I've been, sent letters, they weren't able to be here, but I've been asked therefore to read their letters. The first one is from uh, uh, Kevin Fuller. He is past president of Gideon's. My name is Kevin Fuller. I live in Melbourne, Australia with my wife, Anne. From 1998 to 2003, I was a member of the executive committee of the Gideons International, and from 2004 to 2007, I was world president of the organization. I first came into contact with Pastor Steve Mays when, at his insistence, he made a personal presentation to the executive committee of the Gideons on things that he thought it, uh, should be addressed in the order to maintain the relevance and the integrity of the ministry in the future. As far as I am aware, Pastor Steve is the only outside person that has ever made a personal presentation to the executive committee of the Gideons International. After that, they'd allow nobody else. No, <laughs> that's not in it. I was impressed by him as a person, by his integrity and what he had to say. Uh, we kept in touch. From that time that we, from we first met, he would go to San Francisco and spend a day with me during my stopover on my way back from Australia to Nashville, Tennessee, where the international headquarters of Gideon's is located. He would call me sometimes two or three times a week, particularly during challenging periods in my role. When I was away overseas on Gideon assignments, he would call Anne on a regular basis to encourage and share with her. He gave us the benefit of his wisdom and wise counsel, and we were always touched by his godly advice and presence. He never failed to pray with us, and we were always parted with each other with prayer. The Lord put Pastor Steve into our lives, and we will be eternally grateful to God for this, and to Steve for demonstrating to us what Christian love and compassion and grace really is. Anne and I pray every day that the people we see in Christ, they may see in Christ in us, or whatever we say or whatever we do each day. We saw Christ in Pastor Steve every time we met him or spoke with him or heard about what was going on in his life and his work for the Lord. To me personally, he was my pastor, counselor, confident, mentor, and friend. I loved him dearly, and he will remain in my heart and soul and my thoughts for as long as I live. He was truly a great man of God who never sought greatness, but his humility and grace drew people of all walks of life to him. To Gail and her immediate family, Anne and I send our love, and we commit to uphold you each day in prayer. To the staff and the members of the Congregation of Calvary Chapel, South Bay, we grieve with you over the loss of your precious pastor and friend, but we also rejoice in the knowledge that he is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom he loved and served. If I was asked to write an epitaph for Pastor Steve, it would be the words taken from Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 4. Father, 
I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. How beautifully this encapsulates the life and the work of Pastor Steve Mays, a truly great man of God and a true friend, and sincerely, Kevin. In a second letter, <clears throat> another friend and dear friend, of, of personal friend of Steve and Gail, a, a couple from Motherwell, Motherwell, Scotland, of which your ministry here was involved with in many ways over the years. And... Uh, you know, to share with them, David Simpson, his wife, Kathy. And they've asked me to read it. Actually, he sent a DVD, but he has a very, very strong Scottish accent. And they said they couldn't understand it very well, I guess, with the way, the way it came across. So they, they said, you're a Scot, so you read it. <laughs> so I said, okay, so I'll try. Steve Mays was a man of great influence <laughs> as a pastor. <laughs> A Bible teacher and conference speaker and exhorter and encourager in so many, many ways. Okay, that's it. But uh, <laughs> when I think of Pastor Steve, I think of someone who had the faith of Abraham, the courage of Daniel, the encouragement of a Barnabas, the missionary zeal of a Paul. And using his faith and courage and encouragement and vision, Steve Mays exerted a great influence in innumerable lives. The influence of Steve was found not only within the walls of Calvary Chapel, South Bay, or the surrounding communities of Southern California, but his influence was felt around the world. But his influence was perhaps most deeply appreciated in our friendship. When we were hanging out together every time we visited Southern California, whether it was having coffee, driving to a conference, visiting a hardware store where we could see if there was any more tools he could purchase that he didn't have yet. <laughs> he, he was always influential, never too busy, and his incredibly busy schedule to take time out and spend it with friends. When he was visiting the church here in Scotland, we'd travel around, but he was never interested in the castles and others. He was always wanted to visit somewhere where there had been a spiritual connection, the home of David Livingston, the great missionary, uh, the, or explorer, or John Knox, the great reformer, places that would inspire him in his own ministry. We were thrilled when he was the one able to come and dedicate our current building back in 1999. A phone call from Pastor Steve was never far away. In these calls, it was always about others, always about there to give counsel and advice when needed. Albert Schweitzer once said, Example, example is not the main thing in influencing others, it's the only thing. And Pastor Steve was an example of a, of a believer who influenced and touched the lives of so many. Just like Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, to be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Pastor Steve was a great example and without doubt a man of influence. Our thoughts and prayers are with Gail, the family, and everyone at Calvary Chapel of South Bay. And although we are saddened at the passing of Pastor Steve, we rejoice with you all that we shall see him again. May the Lord richly bless and preserve and keep all of you till his coming. Wow, so this is what my dad saw every Sunday morning. It's quite a view. I feel like I'm looking through his eyes right now. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight and joining my family and celebrating my father's life. Uh, most of you know my dad's testimony and the amazing work God did in his life to enable to touch so many of you out there. Um, I'd like to share a few memories I've had of my dad growing up and some of the special moments we had in the months and days before he passed. Uh, growing up, he taught me so much about the love of God, dedication to the church, work ethic, and business sense. He set an incredible example of a man who feared God and lived a purely spiritual life. The man you saw at this pulpit was the exact same person I saw when he came home. Uh, his beliefs, morals, and convictions never changed when he walked off this stage. There were times when I wanted him to make an exception because I was his son, <laughs> but he never did. Uh, sometimes that would cause conflicts in our home, but that was the sacrifice we both had to make uh, for him to fulfill his calling. So I have tremendous respect for his integrity and can only pray and hope to live up to the high standard he set for me. I have so many great moments in my father as a young child. Uh, he was obviously very busy with the church, and we didn't get to spend as much time as most fathers and sons. However, the times we did spend together were very special. I mostly remember him being just another big kid to play with. He was always goofy 
full of energy, and we would wrestle, play video games, play with our dogs, uh, just do fun things together. She taught me how to fish, how to camp, how to enjoy the outdoors. But it wasn't always playtime at the Mays home, not when, dad, not when Dad was home. You see, for those of you who don't know my father, you'll know he had a major addiction. He was completely addicted to home improvement projects. <laughs> As a kid, I used to dread this time off of work, or when he was off of work. The vacations at the Mays household didn't mean trips to Hawaii or some other exotic place. Instead, it was meant for fixing things around the house. I spent endless hours cleaning out sheds or building new sheds, reorganizing the garage or helping him build uh, one of the old cars he lo loved so much. Uh, honestly, it was hard labor, um, <laughs> but I learned so much about how to fix things um, and the work ethic required to do it right. Uh, he was perfectionist when it came to these projects and when he got, when he, when he got his mind set on something, you knew he was gonna do everything possible to make it perfect. He was relentless that way. Um, I'll give you one example. My sister and I really wanted a tree house when we were younger. Uh, my dad would build, you know, most dads would build a simple platform in a tree. Not dad. <laughs> now he built us this two-story fort complete with uh, <laughs> we had fold-down beds, carpet, screen, a slide to get away. Um, and we spent a lot of special moments out there in the summer playing in there. And I think it was, in some ways, looking back, it was his way of giving us our special place. Uh, the running joke in our family was a dad's declaration that each completed project was the last one. <laughs> so that's it, he would proclaim. And then a month later, we find out there was another one, another project in the works. He just couldn't help himself. He could always find another spot in the roof to install yet another sunlight. Love those. Uh, or a space that needed oak or trim. And it never ended, but I loved him for it. Uh, that is until he started to come to my house um, <laughs> and discuss home improvement projects at my house with my wife. Uh, he had a, you know, I would just look at both of them and shake my head, but he had an incredible vision for design. Nothing was going to stop him. It's his favorite hobby. Um, over the last years of his life, I was able to spend some very memorable moments with, with, with him. Um, looking back on these experiences, I now see the hand of God was preparing us for his departure. A couple of months ago, my Uncle Matt decided to throw a family reunion up in the Sacramento area, and it had been many, many years uh, since we'd seen uh, my mom's side of the family. Uh, in typical Steve Mays fashion, uh, we decided to plan a trip up there, but it was no ordinary trip. Uh, we left LAX airport at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning and came back Saturday at 8 p.m. Uh, <laughs> but it ended up being this incredibly crazy one-day one vacation adventure that I, and we hadn't been together since we were, I was a teenager with our whole family together. It was 12 hours, but, um, but it was honestly one of the most happiest I've seen him in a very, very long time. He had, we absolutely had a blast on that trip, uh, and I'll never forget that trip for the rest of my life. Um, on the Friday before his surgery, he called me and wanted to come visit my family. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but that would be the last time I'd see him in person. Uh, we had a wonderful time together, spent quality time with my kids and wife. And during that, that uh, visit, he gave me a watch that was an exact replica of the watch he had on. He collected watches. Uh, and so we were kind of twins for the day. I have it on. Um, I think it was his way of saying no matter what happened, he would always be with me. And I, always, I also had the opportunity to talk to him the night before he passed away uh, when I was able to tell him I loved him, I had a great conversation. And I just cherished the fact that we had those moments um, you know, before he said goodbye. Um, in closing, I'd like to say that my dad and I had a great relationship, and he taught me so many things about being a man, uh, about business, about relationships. But most importantly, he taught me to fear God and set an unbelievable example of how to live a, dedicated, uh, a life dedicated to the Word of God. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to be his son and can only hope to live by the example he set. Dad, <clears throat> I take comfort in the fact that you are pain-free and rejoicing in heaven. I just hope you don't try to do too many home improvement projects up there. <laughs> I think God's got that under control, although I doubt it'll stop you from trying. Dad, I love you so much, and I will miss you more than you will ever know. I promise to honor your commitment to Christ, and I'll take care of Mom, Heather, Helen, and I'll see you again in due time.
As one of Pastor Steve's surgeons, I am honored to be asked by his devoted wife, Gail, to comment on my relationship and recollection of Steve in this celebration of his wonderful life. Steve was referred to me by his dear friend, Alan Smith. He had a long-term, serious back problem that was affecting his life as your pastor. From his very first visit to my office, he was intelligent, curious, and extremely concerned that if his suffering continued, it would adversely affect his ability to continue his work for the Lord. This added special importance to me because as I am a devout Christian, I understood the importance of a pastor to his congregation. I was very eager to help him. Steve was one of the most intensely grateful patients I have ever had. He deeply respected my sincerity in wanting to alleviate his pain. We bonded and trusted each other completely. I emphasized that I regarded my surgical skills as a gift from God, who is the supreme healer, and that I was only an instrument in his hands. We were truly brothers in Christ, and I desperately wanted to relieve his suffering. He was the ideal patient. He asked all the right questions, understood and accepted his problem, had faith and hope in a good outcome, and was comfortable in placing his difficulties in the hands of the Lord. All of the surgical procedures on his back had gone well without complications. And between surgeries, he was able to return to the mission he loved the most, which was ministering to you, his flock of believers. But after a totally successful final surgery, he was struck down unexpectedly by a probable large blood clot from his leg. However, as I look at the faces of those of you his mission has touched, I know that his deepest desires have been fulfilled in those he led to the Lord. I was devastated to hear of his passing into the heavenly kingdom that Jesus had prepared for him. His progress from his troubled childhood and adolescence through his salvation by his newfound belief in Christ was a powerful message to me. This series of events in his life illustrates the miracles that the acceptance of Christ as our Savior can bring. When I was applying to medical school, I recall visiting Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. There, in the center of a rotunda, is a large statue of Jesus Christ. At the base, is a passage of scripture that I will never forget. It is from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Pastor Steve has finished his course in faith and now rests from his labors. May light eternal shine on Steve, and may he be in peace in the house of the Lord. For Gail and the rest of Steve's family, I pray that your grief will be slowly eased as the vivid memories of Steve's love and concern for you gradually return. in a second here. Um, the, Almori, uh, the Almori said, if I take care of my character, my reputation will take care of me. And I think that Pastor Steve, not only knowing him since 1973, not only did we become like brothers, but he was always always so loving. 
and always caring for people. And I remember many times when Steve, in that pain that he had and the suffering that he went through, that through his suffering, I guess he got closer to God than ever before. And Gail taking care of him and watching over him and his children, I think brought him closer to the heart of God. I can remember at one time in our friendship that not only Steve was a friend of mine, a brother of mine, but he's the one that introduced me to a lot of books. He was a fanatic for books. Uh, England, we went to England and bought books. We bought books everywhere. And Steve was always a man of the word. He loved God's word. He loved teaching the word of God. And every single year, he became better and better at teaching God's word. If you listen to his sermons, not only do they build you up, but they convict you. And they bring you to the heart of God. He trusted in God for his infirmities. I got to share with him. I got to talk to him three days before he passed away. And never knowing that he would be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in just a few days. And when I thought about Steve as I was praying for him that night, I thought of the love that he had for each one of you here tonight. And the great love that he had for Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. In coming to that place, knowing that he loved his sheep, and that God one day would not only do a tremendous work, but already started that work in his life. Every time I saw him in pain, I don't even know how he made it, like Job. But he was always joyful, he was always present before the Lord and always giving thanks to the Lord. Never complaining, never thinking things that come against God, but always standing there looking to the heavens and knowing that God had a purpose for his life and for his family. And how I thank God for the Holy Spirit, for taking a hold of his life and his family. I want to read this before I conclude here about Gail. Gail was a real soldier of the cross. As she died to herself, to take care of her family, including Steve and all his infirmities. And I thank Gail for doing that. And I thank every one of you for being here and all the speakers. May the Lord bless you and keep you guys. Hi, I'm Jay Seculo, Chief Counsel of the American Center for Law and Justice. And I want to let everybody at the Calvary Chapel, South Bay, know that we are praying for you and praying for the family of our good friend, Pastor Steve Mays. What a blessing he has been to the ACLJ. And I will tell you to me personally, He's always been a voice of encouragement during difficult times and key cases. I always look forward to getting that phone call from Steve. He knew exactly when to call us, exactly when we needed to hear from a pastor that would give us encouragement. And Pastor Steve has been such an encouragement to all of us here at the ACLJ. I'm talking to you from our offices, but I also want to let you know that our offices around the globe have also been impacted by Steve and Steve's ministry and the ministry that you all have at Calvary Chapel. And my son Jordan joins me in sending his uh, prayers and thoughts with the family, with also uh, the great ministries that Steve has touched. Uh, he's, there is no doubt that when Steve Mays entered heaven, that he heard from the master, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, Steve was that faithful servant. Uh, again, a blessing to all of us at the ACLJ. I want you to know that we're gonna be praying for you all, praying for Steve's family right now as you go through this important and difficult time. You know, our hope, is found in Jesus Christ. That's what Steve dedicated his life to. And we find out in times like this just how critical that faith in the Lord is. Steve knew that so well, and no doubt rejoicing today uh, in heaven. But again, our prayers and thoughts 
with the family out there, with the Calvary Chapel. Deeply missed. Steve's going to be deeply missed by all of us at the ACLJ, but we rejoice in knowing that he's in heaven with Jesus, sharing again what a blessing he's been to all of us. We'll be continuing to pray for you uh, at this critical time in your ministry. And again, our thoughts and prayers with Steve's family. God bless you from the ACLJ. You're really good friends here in Washington, D.C. Well, what can I say about Steve? I've watched Steve over the years, and I've watched him grow during that time. And as much as he's gone through, not only early in his life, but also in the many, many, many surgeries he's had in recent years, as many experiences as he had, he was still willing to learn new things. In three Gospels, Jesus talks about how important it is not to be an old wineskin, not to become fixed and inflexible and rigid. Jesus said that the blessings were for the new wineskins, for those who would be soft and malleable and flexible and changeable. And for so many folks, as the years grow on them, they become set in their ways. They don't want to learn new things. They're comfortable with what they've always done. In short, they become old wineskins, but not Steve. He was willing to learn new things, try new things, adopt new attitudes that he ever, never had before, and even get in new arenas he'd never messed with and he was willing to learn and expand and grow. I also watched him become a lot more mellow across the years. He was still firm as steel in his convictions, but he didn't feel like he had to be defensive with his positions. He was just comfortable in his strong faith and in the firm stance that he took. Well, here we are today. What can be said? Well, apparently, Steve has now made it through all of his classes, so he got to graduate. He got promoted. He leaves the rest of us underclassmen behind him, so we obviously still have more to learn but we'll miss him, and once we graduate, we'll all get to have a really neat class reunion together. God has already blessed Steve, but now may God bless Gail and the rest of us that haven't yet received our promotions. Boy, Pastor Steve is in heaven way too soon for my liking, but of course, God has his ways, and just remembering this dear man, you know, in Jewish tradition, remembering is an actual holy act in itself. It's like prayer. It, in fact, it's equated to prayer. And, and I just love sitting and remembering Pastor Steve Mays, dear, dear brother and friend. And the one story that comes to mind every time I think of him in this prayerful and holy way is the night he and I ended up at an Orthodox Jewish synagogue on the holiest night of the Jewish calendar, Kol Nidra, or the Yom Kippur Eve. And here, Pastor Steve takes me, I'm the Jewish guy, he's the Goyish Gentile, and he links me up with his Israeli Orthodox friend, takes me to a Jewish synagogue where we end up in this sacred service. And because our host, an Orthodox Israeli Jew, loves this man, Pastor Steve, so much, he actually gives me the honor of carrying the scroll to the platform, what's called the Bima. And this is the guy, Gentile Steve, engineers that whole thing. So to see him in the traditional prayer shawl or talit as it's called in Hebrew, this is the fringed garment that Jesus would have been wearing when the woman touched the fringes or the edges of his garment and was healed. All this orchestrated by what I call a really goyish guy, a real Gentile but a righteous Gentile. And, and that has its own status in Jewish thought. So that's my memory and so many more of my dear brother who I will see soon before the altar of heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, Now it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. For this reason I am sending to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister 
of Christ on our behalf. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Faithful. That is the word I think of when I think of Steve Mays. He was faithful as a pastor and teacher of the gospel. But I, know, I knew him foremost as a faithful friend. Despite his many ministry responsibilities and health challenges, he often reached out to encourage me. And he did so with humility and vulnerability. And that encouraged me to be more vulnerable and transparent with my friends. Steve taught me a lot about friendship. It's one thing to talk about it, though. It's quite another to live it out. And Steve lived it out. Steve was always looking for ways to encourage me at the radio station. I will never forget a station gathering we held for a small group of friends and sponsors at the Universal Hilton. I invited Steve and Gail to attend and enjoy the incredible buffet they serve on Friday nights. He accepted, but asked if I would like him to speak to the group and encourage them. I said, well, I'd love for that to happen, Steve, but our program is really short, so I only have time for 10 minutes. Can you do 10 minutes, Steve? <laughs> Without hesitation, he said, I can do it. I was excited, but I wondered, could a Calvary pastor really only speak for 10 minutes? <laughs> well, he did. He delivered a great message, one we still talk about around the station. And yes, it was exactly 10 minutes. I'll never forget his closing comment. Terry, did I do OK? I kept it to 10 minutes. He said that with his big smile. Just last month, Steve was at the station for an interview. But he and Pastor Rob showed up an hour early so they could walk around the office and encourage the staff. When he finally made it back to my office, he offered to lead staff devotion sometime. That was Steve, a faithful minister and a faithful friend. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So here's the legacy Steve Mays left in me. Be faithful to Christ, be an encourager to others, and be a faithful friend. Well, you'll never know uh, what an honor it is for me to be here today. So I was a 19-year-old kid, and I found myself uh, at Twin Lakes, I believe, Calvary Chapel's conference center up there. And that's where I found God. And uh, I found myself at a Fox Theater in Azusa with a crazy man preaching. <laughs> but I was enamored with him. And I found God there as well. So I think there's a picture that they're going to put on the screen. You know, 30 plus years later, uh, I work at Azusa Pacific University. We bestowed upon Pastor Steve an honorary degree. And so I attended uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, as that 19-year-old. I never dreamed that I would end up sitting on the platform between Pastor Chuck and Pastor Steve. So it's a little surreal that I would be here and, and pay honor to my friend, uh, Pastor Steve. So a couple stories I'd like to share with you. The first, uh, the pastor and Pastor Steve. So you know, Pastor Steve loved to fish. And so I take a group of guys fishing every year. And this particular year, we went to Kodiak, Alaska. And uh, I thought it'd be really good for Pastor Steve to be a part of that trip because, you know, being the pastor of a large church like this uh, is, is a huge responsibility. And my hope was that on that fish trip that he would be able to relax and actually not be a pastor for a while. <laughs> so that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Uh, so we fished the first day and came home, and our, our deal is that in the evening, uh, 12 of us guys get together and we tell the story of our life. The first guy to, first guy to share his story uh, shared the brokenness in his relationship with his wife. Did that fire Pastor Steve up? <laughs> he kicked into pastor mode. 
<laughs> and I watched him minister, and I watched him love, and I watched him pray. And the next day, we fished all day and came back. And the next guy to share uh, talked about his fracture with his daughter. Pastor Steve kicked into pastor mode, and he loved us, and he prayed for us, and he was a pastor. And the third day, we fished, caught a lot of fish, and uh, the next guy that shared talked about his fracture with his son. So Pastor Steve uh, was a pastor on that trip. Now, I need to let you know, Gail, that one time uh, in the middle of the fish trip, uh, we were on the same boat, and he caught a, what I thought what turned out to be a pretty big halibut. And, uh, you know, his back... He was in pain a lot with his uh, issues related to his back. He was leaned over the side of the boat uh, fighting this halibut for about 10 to 15 minutes. And I finally walked over and said, uh, I put my hands near the pool and I said, Pastor Steve, could I help you? And he said in the kindest, most gentle way, if you touch the pole, I'll break your fingers. <laughs> He loved me. He did. <laughs> pastor Steve was a pastor. Pastor Steve was also a brother. So a few years ago, uh, an institution called me up and I began this journey of uh, possibly joining them. Now, nobody at APU knows that, so if we could keep that a secret amongst us, <laughs> that'd work really well for me. And so I called Pastor Steve and I said, here's the situation. Uh, would you just pray for me? And so he did. You know, for many of you, often he would call randomly. He would call me randomly on my cell phone. I'd be in a store, or I'd be someplace else, and he would say, God just told me to call you and pray for you, so he would do it. And so I knew he prayed for me. So I called him up and said, I want you to pray for me about this. Two months later, I had to give an answer to that institution. Pastor Steve had no idea. My phone rang a couple hours before I needed to call them. And he said, Bixby, uh, God told me to call you. I mean, isn't that typical of Calvary Chapel people? <laughs> and then he said, I have a word of the Lord. <laughs> Actually, he said, God told me to call you. What's going on? And I said, well, I need to let them know today. And he said, I've been praying about this. Don't do it. It will not be a good move for you. And I called up two hours later and withdrew my name. Pastor Steve was a brother to me. So on June 25th of this year, uh, Pastor Steve invited me uh, to come to the church and speak to his staff. By the way, I love his staff. I love his staff. I love this church. So after I was done, like always, we walk into his office. There's this beautiful spread of food, and we just jumped into that food and just love uh, Loved eating that. And as we were talking, I noticed in the left-hand corner there was a picture of George Washington dropped on his knees. It's entitled uh, uh, Prayer at Valley Forge. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the picture. It's right on the screen there. And I just was enamored with it. And I said, uh, oh, Pastor, I love that picture. And immediately he said, it's yours. And I said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not taking your picture. He said uh, something like, you know, I, I had another one made. And, and that is for this moment in time. He walked around to the side of his desk, pulled it out and gave it to me. And that picture hangs in my office. Ah, uh, yeah. I just have some great memories of him. So, you know, the common thread of those three stories is this. Pastor Steve was present. He was in the moment always with me. You know, I think about moments of uh, time in the Bible with David and Goliath and David being fully present. And I think of Jesus and the woman at the well. And I think of Jesus and the woman caught in the act of adultery. And I think of Nicodemus and Zacchaeus. And I think of Peter. And I think of Pastor Steve. I think of him being present in the moment. He was able to seize those moments and capture those moments. Uh, he did in my life. So a couple of days ago, I was thinking about, I was hiking in the mountains near where I live. And I was thinking about what I'd share and uh, so I had my iPad on. I was listening to some worship tunes. And I was listening to Steve's, Stephen Curtis Chapman. And he has this song called uh, God is in Control. And I thought I'd close with the lyrics of, of this song. And this is how it goes. This is not how it should be. This is not how it could be. This is how it is. And our God is in control. This is not how it will be. When we finally will see, we'll see with our eyes, we'll see with our own eyes, 
that he was always in control. And we'll sing, holy is our God. And we will finally really understand what it means. So we will sing, holy is our God, while we're waiting for that day our God is in control. God bless Pastor Steve. Hi friends, I'm Johnny Erickson Tata. I so wish I could be with you today, but I was already committed to be up in Fresno, so um, I'm just grateful that Gail and the team here at Calvary Chapel South Bay asked me to say a few words in tribute to our friend Steve. How did I meet this most remarkable man? Well, people who deal daily with chronic pain, I mean jaw-splitting pain, have a way of finding each other. Not because misery loves company, but because they want to bolster each other up with God-honoring encouragement. And that's exactly what Steve and I have done for the last, oh, eight or nine years. It seemed that whenever I was having a really tough, hard day in this wheelchair, um, that would be the day I'd receive an uplifting text from Steve. A few days later, I'd shoot him an email with a few anchors from Scripture. Maybe the following week, I'd receive a note from him or a phone call. Then it was my turn to respond with a letter or a small gift. Back and forth, we went back and forth year after year. And over that time, we amassed an incredible collection of the most amazing Bible verses, scriptural lessons, heartwarming quotations, and shared testimonies. Steve's ministry was a ministry of suffering, and this man suffered well. In fact, he was one of the first of my pain pals. I have about 31 people for whom I pray daily, people who deal with intractable and unrelenting pain. And every day, every day, I would ask the Lord to give his courage to Steve and to these 31 others. And I believe God has answered those prayers. Earlier this year, I wrote a book called Beside Bethesda, in which I talk about the deeper healing that all of us can find in the midst of pain. And I dedicated that book to all 31 of my pain pals, and Steve May's name is right there on the list. Steve taught the rest of my pain pals how to suffer courageously, how to suffer valiantly, with hope and courage, with hope overflowing and an eye to God's glory. Steve believed that there is no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch us until, first of all, it has gone past God and past Christ, right through to you and me. And as Alan Redpath said, if it has come that far, it has come with great purpose. Oh, the crowns that Steve will be able to cast at the feet of our Savior, all because he embraced the man of sorrows in his every grief. Oh, the rewards that Jesus will shower on that man because Steve carefully invested so much, so very much in his eternal account. And one day, you and I are going to join Steve in showering all our accolades and more, casting all our crowns at the feet of the King of Kings. What a glorious day that'll be. And as Steve Mays already knows, just five minutes in heaven will be worth all the pain, all the tears, and all the suffering. Ken and I continue to pray for you, Gail, and for the rest of our good friends at CCSB. God bless you. Thank you for letting me join you today and honoring our dear brother in Christ, Steve Mays. What a blessing to be with family and friends at times like this, how we need the Lord. I was putting down a few things about Steve and Gail, and Karen and I, we came out of the uh, Jesus movement, and we were all saved under Pastor Chuck's ministry there at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And one of my very first memories of Steve is that he started one of his first churches in, at Knott's Berry Farm in Independence Hall. Yeah. 
we were so young, man. We were, you know, young 20s, and we wanted to just reach the world for Christ. And uh, just looking to him, Stephen Gale, oh, what an inspiration as we worked together and saw God do great things. They raised two beautiful kids, Nathan and Heather. And uh, we, our kids kind of, we were kind of growing up together and he loved both of you so much. And uh, he loves the grandkids, talked about them all the time. And Gail, I, I can't tell you how many times he told me how much he loved you. And uh, you were the best nurse of all, man. You were awesome. The four of us had a lot of things in common. Uh, we all uh, about the same age. We started our churches at about the same time. Gail and my wife, Karen, both had daughters that were placed for adoption at birth when they were teenagers. Steve had the honor of meeting Gail's daughter, Julie, uh, about 20 years ago, and Julie is with us right now via live stream. So she's right here with us. Steve and Gail, like Karen and I, we love pugs, okay? <laughs> we are very pugnacious, if you will. <laughs> Our first pug came from the same place that they got their first pug, uh, but I want to tell you a story about their first pug. His name was Mickey. Steve wanted to surprise Gail. And boy, he was excited. <laughs> and uh, he went to this pug rescue and picked out a very fat, old pug <laughs> that was a little funny. <laughs> Gail was shocked and very surprised that Steve walked in with that very fat old pug. <laughs> and this pug would not go down their stairs. Steve, with all of his gifts and all of his talents, he tried to get that pug to go downstairs. Even he was pushing him downstairs, <laughs> only to find out that that poor old dog was blind. <laughs> I felt so bad for him. But that was Steve, always seeing what could be, even in an old, blind, fat pug. Steve was like Jesus. He was a carpenter. He was a little like King Herod. <laughs> he loved to build stuff. This church is just one of his many creations of beauty. Steve was finished, a finished carpenter, but he was also a rough carpenter. He knew how to cut wood so even the slightest flaw would not be seen or noticed. He was that intricate. He knew how to cut that wood and set it in place and you can see it all around. He saw people as a finished work in Christ. It was just his gift. I mean, every week he'd be teaching in here. Every one of you that came here, the word of God. And he used that ministry of teaching the word and the radio ministry light of the world, to sand you guys and to polish you guys. Some of you even got nailed by it. <laughs> and some of you honed down a bit. But it was all to make a beautiful creation in Christ. And thank God that we have Christian radio and K-Wave. Thank God we can hear Pastor Chuck. Thank God we can hear Pastor Steve. Every morning, six o'clock, all right? And man, he, it, he serves it. He serves it up in a very powerful way. But like a finished carpenter, Steve now has finished his work, and he's finished well. 
Steve loved Pastor Chuck so much, and now they're together. Steve and Chuck worked many projects on so many. He told me so many of the things they were doing. He spent a lot of weekends just working with Chuck on his 1963 Ford T-Bird. I mean, that was Chuck's favorite, and he just put all kinds of time into it. It's, I think, right that Steve would go ahead of us. Why? Well, he just wanted to spend some private time with his pastor. He's got him all to himself. <laughs> wow. It seems fitting that one of Steve's first churches was at Independence Hall. He was just an independent guy. He was just that way. But he was so dependent upon the Lord. So dependent. He was a unique person. As it was said, a good friend, loving father, a faithful husband, and a great pastor. Gail, Nathan, Heather, and Julie. I'm going to miss him very much. And I know you guys are going to miss him a lot. But we have the promise that soon and very soon... We're all going to be together. Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Look out. Well, I kind of feel deprived because I didn't have the blessing of knowing Pastor Steve from the 1970s. He, he came into my life in the late 1980s. And so I've only known him for a quarter of a century. <laughs> it has been well said that a man has many acquaintances but very few friends. Steve was one of my best friends. And as I reflected a little bit about what I'd share tonight, uh, Jeff and I did not share notes, by the way. First time I met Pastor Steve, I was in Austria and I was working in a basement, a dingy, dank basement that smelled of mold and mildew. And Pastor Chuck had given some direction about what was to be done in that basement. I was in there, and I thought, literally, I'd been sent to hell. <laughs> and I'm sawing away on this bench and putting these benches in that needed to be replaced. And, and in walks this guy who looks more like Easy Rider than Easy Brother. <laughs> and he looked at me and he walked around the room and he said, do you know there's a 16th inch gap over here? And I said, no, I didn't know that, but if you'd like to fix it, you can do it yourself. <laughs> he proceeded to walk out of the room Handed him the saw and everything. Turned around the next day and he came back. And this time he was a little bit softer and he, he began to tell me why. He said, well, we borrowed the Ferrari from the electrician and Bill Gallatin and I decided to go into Serbia and see the war. And we almost died. How can I pray for you? And it was then that I saw Pastor Steve. Not the carpenter Steve, Pastor Steve. From that day to this, he was one of those men that I could turn to that Proverbs 27 talks about an open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. He had the capacity and the ability to look you in the eye and because he loved you, to tell you the truth. At that time, Connie and I were down at Calvary Chapel Vista with Pastor Brian. And we were known affectionately as Abraham and Sarah <laughs> because we'd been married for about 15 years with no kids. And Steve said, how can I pray for you? And I said, you know, 
We just want to serve the Lord, and we'd love to have a family. He put his hand on me and just began to pray. And he said, Lord, you know what is best for this family. And if it's your will, would you give them kids? Both my sons serve in ministry today. That day in that basement, I met the Pastor Steve that most people know. The next time I really remember a significant moment, I was sitting on the curb at the camp with my head in my hands, bawling like a baby. And in typical Pastor Steve fashion, he walked up and said, why are you crying, you sissy? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing? Why are you carrying around this bitterness? If you don't let it go right here and right now, God can't use you. And in fact, I'm going to call Chuck and tell him to not use you. <laughs> and I did. He taught me how to have joy in a difficult circumstance. He taught me how to love unconditionally. He taught me what it meant to be a, a man of integrity. I remember sitting right about there when we were building this building. And Steve had a nickname for me, and some of you may know it. I was known as Mr. One Candle. And it happened that he was sitting in here designing these chandeliers, as a matter of fact. And I looked at him and I said, Steve, you can't afford those. And so he looked at me and he says, well, what do you want me to do? Put a candle in here? And I said, no, you can afford a dozen. <laughs> and he stomped off and, and just furious, went out the other side of the building, and came back and he said, okay, you're right. And, you know, we need to tone it down. So these are the toned down ones. <laughs> That was my relationship with him. Everything was like that. He would poke at me and I would poke at him and our relationship grew into just this wonderful friendship. I remember sitting on the, the, the seat out in front of the cabin at the camp and you know, we're having our usual conversation. We're talking about guns and knives and <laughs> eating animals of some kind. And, and all of a sudden Steve pulls out from underneath the chair a shotgun and I'm kind of getting a little worried because he's known to take a shot at things every once in a while. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, and about that time this woodpecker was starting to peck on the fascia of the cabin and he just racks around. Boom. <laughs> there goes the fascia, the birds. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, I told him not to do that. As Pastor Jeff was sharing before me, so many things that we got an opportunity to do together with Pastor Chuck, and one really wonderful experience. Matter of fact, Pastor Pat was there. We were in Florida working on this house. And Chuck was famous for getting off the plane and going straight to Home Depot. <laughs> Steve liked that the first day. Second day, not so much. About the third day, we're about 12 hours in, and Steve looked over at Pastor Chuck, and he said, Chuck, I'm going to die. I have to eat. And Chuck, kind of in a somewhat disgusted manner, looked at him, and he said, well, what do you want me to do? Go get you dinner? And Steve said, yeah. <laughs> and so Chuck asked him, what would you like? He said, I'd like a salad. And so Pat and I, I think, ordered burgers or something. So Chuck comes back, and he's got a sack of burgers and fries. We're over there eating, and Steve goes, where's mine? And Chuck holds up a grocery bag with two heads of lettuce and a bottle of ranch.
And he said, here, make your salad while you're working. <laughs> and Steve looked at him, he says, you know, it's a good thing you're saved because otherwise you might be the head of the mafia. <laughs> and at least they finished their victims quickly. <laughs> but ever the pastor, Steve would just say, you know what? All this is for the glory of the Lord. And that's something I learned from him. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Steve did that. He lived his life that way. And I can't imagine the glories that he's seeing now. Amen? Hello, Gail, and friends of Pastor Steve Mays. I'm Bobby Little, Executive Director of the Christian Embassy, a friend of Steve Mays, and Steve had many friends. Our connection is through the ministry here in Washington, where we minister to leaders here, and Steve has come to Washington many times, and one of the great times is when Steve came and he spoke to us at the Pentagon, proclaiming the Word of God as only he can do. What a great gift. Uh, he's an example of what uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, do your best to present yourself to God, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And that's what Steve did. You know it so well. I am honored to have known him. Uh, we will miss him. And I know you will too. So our prayers are with you today. May God continue to bless you and keep you. May he continue to shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. Blessings. Hello, I'm Congressman Randy Forbes from the Commonwealth of Virginia. I just want to thank all of you for having this service today to honor and celebrate the life of a wonderful man, my friend Steve Mays. For all of you who have cared about Steve, who prayed with him, prayed for him, who've been part of his church, part of his ministry throughout the years, for his family, his wife, for all those who loved him, I want to thank you for all that you've done. Steve was something very special to me in this day and age when we have individuals who don't care for other people in many walks of life. Steve was my friend. And one of the things that Steve understood so well was the fact that across this country today, our religious freedoms and our religious liberties are under attack. Many of us are trying to stand up and fight against those attacks. And Steve understood as much as anybody that I've ever met the importance of sometimes just standing with other people. He would come to Washington and he would never ask for anything. He would just walk in my office and he would pray for me. He would call me from time to time, send me a note. And I felt I was a part of his life, he was a part of my life, but also that I was a part of his church. And oftentimes he would send me pictures of the individuals in the church praying for us here in Washington. I would share that with our colleagues, members of the Congressional Prayer Caucus, which is over 100 members strong. And they would from time to time say that they not only heard those prayers, but they felt those prayers. I remember in one particular situation when we were in a very, very tough fight for religious freedom issues, that Steve sent me, without even knowing we were in that fight, a picture of the church with people all across the church kneeling in prayer. And the caption was simply, we're praying for you. For all of you who joined with Steve in that effort, thank you. And like me, I know that many of you will have a vacuum and a big miss in our hearts because we will miss our friend Steve Mays. But one of the things that gives me joy as I think about this day is that as much as anybody I know, we know where Steve is today. We know that he's with his Savior, Jesus Christ. And not only do we know that, but we know that Steve knew that he knew that he knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he's going to spend eternity with him. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. And just thank you, Steve Mays, for being a wonderful friend and a wonderful servant. God bless you all.
Gail, thank you for the honor to be here tonight to honor a friend. When Steve would call, in fact, my last conversation with Steve was just about two weeks before his surgery, and he, he called to ask if I could come and preach during his absence. And, you know, I love this church because you make me feel like a preacher. <laughs> and I was convinced that Steve would tell you before I would come that you laugh at his jokes. You say amen when he preaches, make him feel like a preacher. <laughs> I was trying to think of when I first met Steve, and I, honestly, I cannot remember. Steve was like the older brother that went off to college, and all of a sudden I found out I had a brother. <laughs> and Steve was he, was, he was literally, he was like an older brother to me that would just, he would call out of the blue. And I'm amazed tonight as I hear uh, all these testimonies and, and the, the ones speaking about the friendship that Steve had, because that truly was Steve. But when he was with you, he was with you. And he focused upon you and upon that relationship. And he did speak often of his family, of Gail and his children, but also of his congregation. Steve was not just an amazing guy. He was a very amazing guy. I mean, look around. Look at the church that through his ministry that has come together, one of the most diverse, eclectic churches that I've ever been in. People who love the Lord, who love the word of God. Steve was a preacher. And there's two things that I, I can really, that really stick out about Steve. One is that when he would get behind the pulpit, there was an anointing that would come upon him that he, he could teach the word of God. I, I think of Acts chapter four, verse 13 where they said they marveled at Peter and John, at their boldness. And then it says at the end of that verse, it said, then they realized they had been with Jesus. You see, what made Steve such an amazing Bible teacher is that he spent time with Jesus. Jesus radically transformed his life, and he never forgot it, and he never hesitated to tell you about it. The other thing was that would that I think of Steve, what I think of when I think of Steve, we were spending the day together one time out here in Southern California, and he was, I was speaking at a, a banquet, and he was just going to come out and hang out with me, which I thought was neat. You know, he has all this stuff to do, and he just wants to hang out. And he was in the back seat, and I was in the front seat. Uh, me and my, my assistant, we were driving down the interstate, and I hear Steve rustling in the back, and all of a sudden I see a hand thrust up between the seats. He goes, you want an energy shot? No, Steve, I'm okay. <laughs> now I know the secret to how he had so many friends. He had to be drinking those energy shots all the time. <laughs> there was another thing that was special about Steve. And I think it was because of his own experience of being in the ministry. And you really don't understand how difficult it is for a family of a minister until you've been in the ministry. And Steve actually ministered, he, he's one of the few that I have worked with in my time in national ministry that has actually ministered to my family. He's ministered to my children. He has expressed kindness and generosity and love to my children because he knows from personal experience the demands upon the families of those that are in the ministry. I was shocked when I heard the word. In fact, I had talked to Steve, as I mentioned, just a couple of weeks before the surgery, and I told him I'd be praying. I prayed with him on the phone before we got off, and then I, I knew the surgery was coming, so I called him. And I got the answering machine or the, the voicemail of his cell phone. And then the next day, I found out that he had gone on to be with the Lord. And I was shocked because you never expect you're just never expecting that. Steve, he was, to me, I thought he was the energizer bunny. <laughs> that he would never stop. Because he just persevered through everything. And when I had that last conversation with him, he was actually, Gail, he was the most upbeat, joyful that I had heard. I mean, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even tell he was going into surgery. He was so upbeat. 
In fact, we were making plans he was going to be with me in my home in just a couple of weeks in Baton Rouge. And I told him I was going to make him eat some catfish and crawfish etouffee again. <laughs> but as I was thinking of Steve, this passage of Scripture came to mind that I want to share with you tonight. And I do want you to know that he loved you deeply and dearly. He was a shepherd to you, and you were his flock. But the Lord has called him home. And I think of the words of the Apostle Paul that he wrote to Timothy. He said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Steve Mays, he kept the faith. And in a day when so many don't make it, across the finish line in this race of life, of keeping the faith, Steve finished strong. He set an example for all of us. He said, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And because of his ministry of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, many Many will have that crown of righteousness because of his testimony of the grace and the goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. From Mike McIntosh to Pastor Skip to Greg Laurie, who will speak in a few minutes, have you ever been in a service of memory like this where there has been so wonderful applause of a person's character and ministry and devotion to the Word of God. For this old man, this has been a wonderful, amazing, praiseworthy service. Give praise to the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Steve Mays in my life and in the life of this wonderful church could be expressed briefly in three words. Of all that has been said tonight and all of us hope that we would say something different or unique about this wonderful man of God. He had a gift of discernment. You need that when you teach and study the word of God. What is God saying? What is God interpreting in this passage to the life of the reader? I wouldn't say that Steve Mays was a prophet, but he had a very unique gift of discerning the Spirit of the Lord, not only in his ministry, but in his relationship with staff, and individual people, he could see clearly to the point right away. He not only was discerning, but he was decisive. There was nothing that was quasi or hesitant about his life. He was true to the heavenly vision. You could always know exactly where he stood and what the word of God meant and what the word of God was saying. And thirdly, he was devoted. The verse that comes to the mind about his ministry is Revelation 1-9. For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That was his passion. That was his obsession. That's all he thought about. He was a student of the word of God. He has probably the largest library of original uh, issues of the great theological books. He spoke to common people, and as the Bible says of Jesus, the people heard him gladly. But behind his simple, easy to understand words about the profound truths of the scripture, there was a man who drilled deep 
and who knew the authority of the word of God and those who amplified it through the years. The Joshua that follows him, how wonderful to be able to say this, will experience of a church that's united, his recent emphasis on prayer here, they will be well-fed, the staff is strong, there is no division, the vision is clear, and the church, I believe, is ready to launch greater outreach for the salvation of souls. May that be the joy of the generation to come from this wonderful church. Yes. For over 40 years, the word has been used 30 times. I counted it tonight while I was sitting there being the last speaker. You do some strange things. <laughs> was the word faithful. That's what God requires of you and of me. Are you faithful to God? Can you be relied upon? Are you accountable? The Bible says the whole world will be accountable to God. Can you give a good reason why you do certain things? And we remember that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things in the body, whether they be good or bad. Thank God for the future of this church, which is going to be brighter than even some of the promises of God we understand. And then allow me to say this, please. Forty-two years of faithful devotion to one woman. Not a mark of a lack of integrity in the life of Steve Mays. Not a mark. And in a day when ministers are not only under attack, but have failed foolishly in the heavenly calling, there is only one memory of Steve Mays, and that is he was faithful to his wife and devoted to his family. And we need to recognize tonight, dear Gail, she's the mama of the church, and you know Steve was the papa. Gail, would you honor us by standing? Please. Gail, everybody needs a mama, and you're our mama. She said to Carol and to me, the last month or two, they couldn't get enough of each other. Sweeter as the years go by. After some beautiful memories of Pastor Steve, Greg Laurie is going to preach. If you are here tonight to give a tribute to Pastor Steve Mays and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're not sure your sins are forgiven, the greatest tribute you could not only give to the Lord Jesus who died for you and rose again, but for this precious pastor to open your heart to Christ and when Greg preaches, receive the blessed Lord. For the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. A valiant Christian soldier has laid his armor down. The fight of faith is finished. But for Steve Mays, the victor's crown. Give glory to God.
Good evening and welcome to Living on God's Word. Living on God's Word is presented to you by Calvary Chapel of South Bay, located in Carson, California. We ask you to get your Bible and follow along with Pastor Steve Mays and us in a truly blessed evening studying God's Word. When the Word of God is allowed to go into a person's heart and into a person's life, it begins to yield the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of God is the goodness of our Lord, and the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When I listen to the gossip and all the weirdness that goes through the body of Christ, I am convinced that those people do not know the goodness of the Lord. Because when you come to know the goodness of the Lord, there is only one thing, honestly, that you can do in your life. And that is to keep your eyes on the Lord and to thank God for what he's done in your life and to pray for those who are struggling, but never take your eyes off of the Lord. You know, we had so many young fellows coming in at that time that had just uh, been out into the world and into the drugs and so forth. And so Steve was just another one uh, of the many that God was drawing to himself at that time. I will give it to you this morning, and it is a conviction. And I will not apologize for what I'm going to say, because it is the word of the Lord. When Nehemiah got done, he had them all stand up and say amen, and they said amen, praise the Lord. Concerning all that he had, his peace, he gave it away. Concerning the king's keys to the kingdom, he gave it away, and he gave his glory away, and finally he gave his life away. In other words, for no other reason but do you believe that you're closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe that? Boy, we ought to live that way. I mean, if I know that I'm closer today than yesterday, that the Lord's coming back, what am I doing to get ready for that moment in my life? His kingdom meant nothing to him. His throne had no power. But here was a man that was touched by God. Thinking somehow I could do it by myself But slipped and fell down on my face Now by the power vested in me by the state of California and by the board of trustees of Azusa Pacific University, I hereby confer upon you the degree Doctor of Divinity. Congratulations. And interesting, it says that Christ reckoned himself to God. In other words, we reckon the old man dead. I made a decision. I'm going to follow Christ. So no matter how big a ministry gets even in my own heart, if I'm in the Word, then it's going to be the stabilizing factor of my heart. And though you don't understand, and you're never going to understand. I remember when Nathan's bike was stolen, he was real young, he was crying. I just said, you know, son, it's terrible living in this world. It's terrible what people do. But I want you to know that's exactly what Satan does. He steals the soul. He brings sin into our life, and he steals and robs our relationship with God. And Nathan told me later on in years of his life, he says, I never forgot that. And that's what needs to happen today. You cannot quit. You cannot escape. You need to look to God like you've never looked before. And we need to begin to pray. And if we are in sin, we need to get out. What did Paul say? None of these things moved me. Neither did I count my life dear, that I might finish the course that God gave to me with joy in my heart. And so he looked at the cross, and that cross is your will and God's will. If I want a pure conscience, then I have to wash it with the Word of God. So when you have devotions, you're washing your windows. We need to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so we don't what? Give in. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? That's the exciting thing about Jesus Christ. He's on fire in our heart because the Word of God. If God wants to take you, go then. So I'll meet my wife in the air. We used to say, here, there, or in the air. When we finally come to realize we love each other, we become friends, 
then for the rest of our lives we're just friends. And that's what makes it. And so today you stand and that's what marriage is all about. And, and it's just so cool. So, you know, as you face each other, JR, let's face each other for a second, hold each other's hands. JR, will you take Heather to be your lawful wedded wife? Will you love her and minister to her? Will you be with her, always encouraging her? Be by her side, pray with her, and minister to her very needs. Hold her when she needs to be held, and, and just give her space when she needs to be, give space. And would you do that in Jesus' name? And Heather, would you take JR and would you love him and minister to his heart and watch over his life and make sure you point the way to Jesus Christ because we know that you're stronger and that's okay. But we know that God's given a hunger in his heart. Will you feed that hunger and encourage him to be all that he can for Jesus Christ? I will. And would you repeat after me, JR? Heather, Heather. before God, before God. And, these and these witnesses, I will love you. I will and take care of you. I'll minister to you and pray for you. I'll be by your side and always help you. I only ask that we could remain friends and lovers. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Heather, would you, as you look into his eyes, repeat, JR, before God and these witnesses, I will love you and I will encourage you. I'll learn to be quiet. Yes, yes. There's a little thing in there. Just a little slant, you know? Little daughter father here. I'll learn to be quiet. I'll learn to be quiet. And to speak up. And to speak up. I know that you make a fa great father. I know that you make a great father. And a great leader. And a great leader. I love you. I love you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you can kiss your bride. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Rosaldo. Been probably the best uh, exciting time in my life, probably because my family's back together. As you well know, Heather was gone for about 15 years or so, and she finally came back, and she's now married, and now in fellowship, and so everyone is here tonight. It's just a great thing to have my whole family take up a role, and I can say that, you know, they're, it's, it's cool. I mean, to me, that is what it's all about, you know, and to be a senior pastor is one thing. You know, it's, got, it's great having five services on Sunday, but when you have five services on a Sunday and your daughter is gone, it's not, it's so what? But it's when you have, you know, your family home and they're walking with God. That, to me, is really what it's most important about. So the other stuff, you can take it and leave it or take it away doesn't make a difference. But you can only, you only come once. Like, you know, people come and go, but your family comes once. And so, you know, to, to go back and to have God deal in my heart and tear my heart apart and have me go through the hospital and everything else, he did a phenomenal work. I would have never believed that God would have done what he did, but he did. And then to say that she came back at the very last operation, I cannot attribute the operations to anything else but the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I got to believe that there's a thorn in my flesh for a reason, and it is to humble me and keep me broken before him, and that's okay. I've come to live with that. And then, of course, my wife. What do I say? You know, I didn't want to get married until that blonde walked in front of me one day. And the Lord said, there's your wife. And I said, the Lord, get behind me, Satan. No way. And she was gorgeous. Hair down to her ankles, braided, little flower in her hair, bell bottoms, big old happy face. You know? She had no idea who I was. See, a little bit we knew each other for a little bit, not very long. And so I went that night to bed, and I opened my Bible. And the Bible says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and has favor with the Lord. I said, oh, Jesus, no. This is not from God, and I closed it. <laughs> Next day, I got up and took a shower, and I heard this voice. Stephen, call her. She's crying. It's her birthday. I said, I got you, Satan, now. I got you. So I had to get somebody to call somebody. What's this girl's phone number? And so I called her, and guess what? She's crying. I go, why are you crying? She goes, it's my birthday. I said, oh, no, no. <laughs> She lived in Costa Mesa. I lived in 29 Palms, Victorville, Victorville. And I said, can you come up here? She goes, I'll be right up. 
And the Lord says, see how obedient she is? Oh, Jesus, no, no. So she came up two hours later, walked in the front door. I was the elder of the house in charge of all these guys, 34 guys, and I think it was 15 women. She thought she was going to move up to help me do and deal with the women. So she walked in the front door. I said, do you like anybody? She goes, no. I said, are you going with anybody? She goes, no. I said, would you like to get married to me? She goes, yeah. She goes, when are you thinking? About next week. She goes, okay. So we shook hands. So I called my mother. Mother, I'm getting married. Well, Steve, I saw you just last week. I know. Well, what's her last name? I said, I don't know. I didn't ask her. My mom goes, are you back in drugs again? No, mom. Well, we've been married 42 years, so it worked, you know. Secondly, last week, I told you about this glove, amen? And it broke my heart that you didn't believe me. I went home and told my wife, I said, all four services just looked at me like, don't lie, Pastor Steve. And it really got to me, and I thought, okay, that's it, I've had it. So, I brought it. No, 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 you're going to repent. No, you're not getting off that easy. So I just want, I want to show something to you, because it's just like, it's not a normal glove. What is that? Tell me what that is. Is that, could that be Bluetooth? Could it? What do you think? Yes, Pastor Steve, let's say that. You put this on. This is a speaker. This is a microphone. Now, if you knew my number, you could call it right now, it would ring. And I could talk to you. So let's say, Pastor Steve, we're sorry for not believing you. Pastor Steve, we're sorry for not believing you. Well, thank you. I will not lie. This is it. Can you believe that, honestly? They want me to wear this so they can get a hold of me all the time. This is bad. This is a bad thing. And look at that Bluetooth going crazy. See it? So I can turn it off. Oh, it's off. See? Pastor Steve does not lie. Amen. <laughs> Hidden in the pages is a life behind the key. And when our work on earth is done, we'll be living in the life to carry on. You know we had good times together, but the man. Good to be in the house of the Lord. It is. 
Amen. There's only one place better, and that's to be with him in heaven. That's a wonderful thing. For me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. So my wife came to me today, and, and she says, you know, you remember you felt like you wanted to be Paul the Apostle and just have nothing else but just Jesus and the Bible, and you're going to preach around the world. I said, uh-huh. And she says, and we've been able to do that together. I said, yeah, we have. She says, you remember how Paul the Apostle was given that thorn in the flesh, and we prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and the church prayed and prayed, and God never took it away? Uh-huh. Well, honey, um, I don't think it's time to quit. I think it's time for God to give you more grace because I still feel like you should keep going. I thought, that's really sweet. As long as I have a mind and a heart, I want to preach and teach. And, and, and uh, if this is whatever God wants, and uh, either I'm going to wake up in heaven or I'm going to wake up in a world of pain, that's God's decision. And one of the things that we know Steve would like and that Gail has desired is to have a message tonight on the hope in Christ and heaven. And I don't know anybody better equipped to do that than Greg Laurie. So after Harvest Band plays and leads us in a little worship, Greg is going to come and share, and then we'll close together. So let's worship. Would you stand?
Tessa wept The morning sun was dead The savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon him Son of God is laid in darkness. Battle in the grief. The war on death was waged. The fire of hell forever broke. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. It's perfect love cannot be.
Hello, everyone. Why don't we uh, pray together? Father, this has been a very special night, one that we will not quickly forget, because we have reflected on a very special life. A man that you called and brought glory to your name through. And we thank you, Lord, for a life well lived. We thank you for an example, when there are so many poor ones out there, of a man who started and finished his race well. And Lord, we too want to finish our race well whenever that day would come when you would call us home or if you would come for us before death because there is a generation that will not see death but they'll be caught up to meet you in the air. Oh Lord, we hope we're that generation. But even if we aren't, we know one way or another we're getting to heaven. And that's our hope. And we thank you for it. We ask you to bless our time in the word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. What a wonderful evening this has been. Not going to preach a long sermon. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> but on Thursday night, you guys are used to having a Bible study, aren't you? Yes. And so let me just offer a little theology without apology, if you would allow me. And let's just think a little bit about where Pastor Steve is right now. We've reflected back on his life up to this point, where he came from, what God did in his life. But now where is Pastor Steve? Can anyone offer a guess? <laughs> that is the correct answer. <laughs> Pastor Steve is in heaven right now. It's hard to wrap our minds around this place that we call heaven. Heaven can seem so mystical, so surreal. So I think it's good to have a little down-to-earth talk about heaven. C.S. Lewis said, and I quote, heaven is not a state of mind. Heaven is reality itself. And in the Bible, we have glimpses given to us of heaven. There's a lot of things we discover. Of course, we discover that heaven is a place, a place where we will have new bodies that are strong and healthy, a place where pain is gone, a place of pure joy, a place where we will have an eternal perspective, and most importantly, that place where God is, where we will worship Him. You know, I've always believed in heaven, of course, ever since I've been a Christian, and I've preached on it many times, like most pastors have, but when the Lord unexpectedly called our son Christopher home to heaven in 2008, I became an avid student of heaven. I wouldn't qualify as an expert. I don't know that anyone is an expert on heaven apart from Christ himself, but I am a student of heaven and I've spent a lot of time studying it, wanting to know more about it. And one thing I've discovered is it's really important for all of us to think more about heaven. I know the response, oh, some people, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. I would suggest to you, some people are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. And we need to be heavenly minded. And I think you will find that those that think the most about the next life do the most in this one. Steve Mays was a heavenly minded man. And it gave him a perspective in life on this earth. And so here's what the Bible says, Colossians 3. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. This is an interesting phrase, set your minds and set your hearts. It speaks of a diligent, active, single-minded investigation. Also in the Greek, it's in the present tense, and it means that it's saying to us that we should keep thinking about heaven. A real simple translation is, think heaven. As Warren Wiersbe once wrote, and I quote, for the Christian, heaven isn't simply a destination, it's a motivation, end quote. C.S. Lewis described this longing that we all have for heaven as the inconsolable longing. He said, and I quote, there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we have ever desired anything else. It's a secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want, end quote. So what do we know about heaven? Well, we know that one day God will give us a new body. And we all know how much Pastor Steve suffered 
I was really moved by that video that Johnny Erickson taught us sent, how, how they were sharing in their pain together. And she dedicated that book to Pastor Steve along with many others. And in his book, Overwhelmed by God, Pastor Steve wrote these words and I quote, I understand what it feels like to be overwhelmed. I really do. But no matter what situations or trials you're walking through right now, I want to assure you that God is completely aware. He's sovereign and in control, and he will use the situations to do a mighty work in you and through you. Pastor Steve continues, may I share my best advice? Stop fighting the Lord and let him do his work. Allow yourself to be overwhelmed by his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his mercy, his purpose, his power, his holiness, his spirit, his word, his provision, his victory, and his promises. Well, what are those promises? So here's one. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Pastor Steve is more alive today than he has ever been, but he is in heaven with the Lord. Here's another one of those great promises. In his presence, there is fullness of joy, and on his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Here's another. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Steve also writes in his book, quote, when someone close to us is sick or dying, we want that person to hang around, to stay alive, because selfishly, we don't want to be alone. Whereas it's possible God wants to release that person and give him or her a brand new body. See, Steve has been released from the shackles. You know, it's interesting. Paul writes there in Timothy, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the course. Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day, and not to me only, but to all who love is appearing. By the way, the word crown, uh, the name for crown is, is Stephanos or Stephan or Stephen or Steve. Uh, <laughs> Steve's name means crown. And I know that there are a number of crowns the Lord is probably already giving him or will give him very soon. But the word that Paul uses there prior to these statements, he says, I know that the time of my departure is at hand. Did Pastor Steve know that? Well, we can't say with any certainty. One of the last things he did was he wrote Gail a, a little love note. As we already heard, he went to see his son Nathan and spent time with the grandchildren. Maybe there was a sense in Steve's heart uh, we don't know with certainty, but it's interesting because the word that Paul uses there for departure means to strike the tent. You know, this body we live in, it's like a tent. It's not meant to last forever. I don't know about you if you like to go camping. We know that Pastor Steve blows away woodpeckers, so we want to... <laughs> that was a little shocking to me. Uh, but... <laughs> But my favorite part of camping is when I get there and when I leave. <laughs> you know, I love the idea of camping. Let's camp. Isn't camping great? Then after about, you know, an hour, it's like, let's go home again. <laughs> Pastor Steve has struck the tent. What's heaven like? Well, we know it's a place. It's as much of a place as Los Angeles or New York or Rome or Paris or any other city you want to name. It's a place. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. So that's a simple thing. It's a place. Another thing, this is a no-brainer. It's way better than earth. Yeah. Way better. <laughs> Paul said that he had a longing to go and be with Christ, which was far better. And that could actually be translated much, much better. Uh, or as they would say in Hawaii, mo better bra, you know. <laughs> Heaven is described not only as a place, but as a paradise. Remember Jesus said to the thief on the cross, who said to our Lord, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Christ said, truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
and the apostle Paul who died and actually went to glory and was called back to earth described it simply this way. He said, I can't put into words what I saw and heard, but I'll tell you this much. It was paradise. And the word that he uses there is a word that describes the royal garden of a king. I don't know what we could even compare that to, but it's the idea of a magnificent garden and a palatial estate that is manicured and cared for. He said it was just paradise. And by the way, if someone in heaven was given the choice to come back to earth, I guarantee they would want to stay right where they are. So it's a paradise. It's a place. It's a city. We're told in Hebrews 11:10, God is the architect of that city and we're looking for the city that is to come. You know, sometimes we get this weird concept of heaven, like we're gonna just sit around in clouds and pluck harps and, and it's gonna be the most boring place ever. The Bible tells us it's a place, it's a paradise, it's a city. Hey, cities have things to do. Cities have restaurants. Uh, cities have activities. You do things in cities. I expect to do things in heaven. The Bible tells us in heaven we'll worship. The Bible tells us in heaven we will serve. And yes, the Bible tells us in heaven we will eat. And that's good news, isn't it? The Bible also describes heaven as a country. Hebrews eleven sixteen. we desire a better country that is a heavenly country. You know, a lot of times we sort of Think of earth as the real thing and heaven as a pale imitation. Actually, it's the very opposite. Heaven is the genuine article. Earth is the pale imitation. Think of the most beautiful thing you've ever seen on earth. The most magnificent sunset. That special moment with someone you love. And, and that's just a glimpse of the glory to come. Hebrews 8, 5 says, we serve in a place of worship that's only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. That's where Steve is. He's in the real place. Now, when we get to heaven, will we recognize one another? What do you think you're gonna be more stupid in heaven than you are on earth? <laughs> of course you will. Now, sometimes those of us who are follically challenged we all can't have Skip Heitzig's hair. <laughs> By the way, that's a hair piece. No one's ever... <laughs> Bald as a cue ball, Skip Heitzig. <laughs> and I'm going to go buy one later. <laughs> but we often joke and say, well, and, you know, in heaven we'll, we'll have a full head of hair. Well, what if the perfected state is baldness and heaven is... <laughs> or hair is part of the curse? That's something to think about. Steve and I shared that. But listen to this. We'll not only know one another, but our love will be stronger and pure and sweeter. There's no more a break in our love and there is a break in our thoughts. Death breaks ties on earth, but it renews them in heaven. And you know, we may be there sooner than we think because the Bible speaks of an event. We call it the rapture. That will happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which who are alive and remaining shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then Paul goes on to say, therefore comfort one another with these words. Why did he say that? Because the believers in Thessalonica were concerned that they had loved ones who had died and they thought maybe they missed the rapture or they would never see them again. Paul's saying, there's going to be a reunion one day. You'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. So, Gail, you could just be going about your business. I don't know where Gail is. Where is Gail? There she is. Hello, Gail. God bless you. Gail, you could just be going about your business. And all of a sudden, even faster than you can blink, there's Steve. There we are, reunited that fast with our loved ones. I'm looking at my son, Christopher. You're looking at loved ones that have gone on before you. And that's what we're going to be able to experience when we're in the presence of the Lord for all eternity. Let me just close with these thoughts. You know, the longer that I've been a pastor, and I've been a pastor for 40 years, I haven't been married quite as long as Pastor Steve and Gail. Only 40 years for us. We're newlyweds, you see. <laughs> but um, the longer I live as a pastor, the more I'm impressed with character than I am with charisma. You know, over the years, we've seen a lot of charismatic, powerful 
preachers come and go. Some burn out, some flame out, some crash and burn. But when I see a man that starts a journey, stays on that journey, and finishes that journey, a man who loves God, a man who loves his wife, a man who loves his children, a man who loves his church, I'm impressed. And that's Pastor Steve. He finished his race well. Charles Spurgeon, one of Steve's heroes, uh, wrote these words, quote, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you. So carve your name on hearts, not on marble. That's what Pastor Steve did. He, he carved it in your hearts. Now closing word from Pastor Steve, again from his book, Overwhelm. What is the purpose of God for your life? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever wondered why you're here on this earth and why you are who you are? God created you for a reason. It's amazing, really. He has both a purpose and a plan for you. Hence, you are uniquely formed and fashioned as an individual. Your purpose and life plans are just as unique. And that's true. God made you for a purpose. He made you to know him. And, and I've been asked to uh, just give you an opportunity to believe in Jesus if you haven't. I was going over some of my old emails and I came across this, an email from Pastor Steve that he sent me some time ago. He wanted to get together and so we spent some time together and he was asking me about evangelism and, and sharing the gospel and calling people to Christ and he says, and I'm reading from his email now, so I share the fruits with you, my brother. In the last two Sunday morning services, 200 people received Christ. In our Good Friday service, in the morning, 40 gave their lives to Christ. And in our Friday night, Good Friday service, 30 gave their life to Christ. And at our sunrise service, 200 stood before me in the tennis courts and said the sinner's prayer. And back at the church, another 100 came to know the Lord, which means in the last two weeks, 570 people came to Christ Thanks for taking the time with me. I love this stuff. You know, isn't that great? Steve was a pastor, he was a teacher, but he also was an evangelist. He had a gift to call people to Christ. And in his honor and thanking God for his life, if there's anyone here that doesn't have that hope of heaven, uh, we wouldn't want to dismiss you tonight without it. So why don't we just close in prayer. Father, again, thanks for the hope we have in Christ. Because we who have trusted you know one day we'll go to that place, that paradise, that city, that country, and we'll be with you and we'll be reunited with loved ones who have preceded us. But Lord, we know there might be some here that don't know you yet. There might be some who will watch this at another time, a video a replay of it, or, or hear it somewhere else and may not yet know you. So Lord, we pray for them that they will come to know Jesus. Listen, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you're not sure if your sin is forgiven, if you don't have the confidence that you will go to heaven when you die, if you want to be sure that you're right with God, why don't you just pray this prayer right where you are, wherever you are, wherever you're hearing or seeing this, pray this prayer after me. Just a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're a savior. And I thank you for coming to this earth and dying on the cross for me and then absorbing God's wrath in my place and rising again from the dead. I turn from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. You know, one day we'll see all the fruit that comes from a life well lived that's been passed on to you and you pass it on to others. And I just encourage all of you to follow the example of this man of God and we thank the Lord for him and I thank the Lord for you as well. God bless you guys. Well, what a wonderful evening. I want to, on one hand, thank all 
of you for coming and also the speakers, some of which drove or flew quite a distance to come and just to be able to share four or five minutes. It's how much Steve meant to them to do what they did. And uh, then those that sent in letters and videos and uh, letter and messages and uh, that we were able to share. And uh, all of the pastors over here, there's quite a number of Calvary Chapel pastors, perhaps others as well, that have come just to be with here to, tonight to love Steve and to be grateful for him, what he's meant to, to all of our lives. And uh, it's a wonderful family to be a part of it and uh, we've all kind of brought into it. First, we, as the Lord raised up Chuck Smith, and of course he went home October 3rd, a year ago, and Steve went home October 2nd. Just only almost a year apart to the day. But uh, it's quite a family. And uh, oh, to Terry Fay, I do want to make a comment from uh, Salem Broadcast, a vice president there, making a little cheap shot, I thought, at Calvary Chapel pastors being over 10 minutes, and uh, <laughs> there's, there's 50 pastors over here who'd <laughs> like to chat with you, <laughs> and I do believe you charge by the minute, <laughs> so I don't get that. <laughs> you should be very appreciative, I think, of the tens of thousands of hours that Salem has Calvary pastors on. You should, you should be very grateful. And, that the anointing would continue mightily. But, <laughs> you know, I, to me, just listening to all this tonight, and all the words from all the directions, whether people around the world and from the government, from various ministries, and all these other things within the body of Christ, the family of Christ, and the, the many churches, and... Uh, Steve was just my friend, dear friend. I was down in uh, Guatemala when this happened. I had read talked before, and he knew the surgery course, and he'd asked me to set up and uh, commit to a number of services that I was able to do when he knew it was coming. And uh, we were, Gene was with Gail during the surgery, and they had some meals together in the following days and hours. and. Uh, I'd call and talk to Gene and got a report every day how things were going. And he had a wonderful night the night before. They, Gene and Gail uh, were together with Steve for about an hour and they just had a wonderful evening of sharing and fellowship. And, uh, and Gene commented that when they were leaving, I guess Gene and Gail hugged each other and Steve said something about you two take care of each other. And we've been friends for many, many years, but it didn't seem significant at all at the time. And then as uh, I guess Gail gave him a kiss as they were leaving, and then Steve asked my wife for a kiss, which, uh, well, we'll deal with that in heaven. But, the, uh, but, <laughs> funny to you, but, <laughs> but uh, anyway, the next morning, I'm coming back, I get on a plane, and as I'm landing and turning on my email, Los Angeles here is, he's, he's in heaven. And Gail had asked me to come and to tell the staff. And then we came over. And what a day, many of you were with us that Thursday night. And only a couple weeks ago. But what a wonderful life well lived. And how much it is that God desires we would all have that life. As I think of what Steve had to say and said from this pulpit for thousands of hours over and over again, it makes me think of what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Thessalonica. And he said, or pardon me, in Colossia, he says, God has, keep a sec has kept a secret for centuries and generations past, but now at last it has pleased him to tell it to those who love him and live for him, and this is the secret, that Christ in your heart is your only hope of glory. So everywhere we go, we talk about Christ to all who will listen, warning every man and teaching every man. 
For we want to be able to present each man perfect unto God for what Christ has done for each one of them. And this is my work, and I can do it only because of his mighty work within me. And this is what I've asked of God for you, that you would be encouraged and knit together with strong ties of love, that you would have the rich experience of knowing Christ with real certainty and clear understanding. So let your roots go down deep into Christ and see that you go on growing in him, for he is the highest ruler with authority over every other power. That's the message Steve delivered to you over and over and over again. And may God richly bless you. And as we close tonight, we, I think Rob and Pat are going to go and get Gail, bring her up here and pray for her as we can all just ask God's blessing upon this wonderful helpmate. I knew Steve, I suppose, as well as anybody. And I can honestly tell you, He'd have been a mess without this woman. <laughs> now, I'm a little more even with Steve. <laughs> but he's quite a blessing. To me, a little sister. Our birthdays are the same day. But anyway. You know, behind any great man, there's an even greater woman. Wouldn't you agree? I think it'd be appropriate this time. Let's stand in honor of Gail. We made it. It's hard to look at her though. And when I thought of you at this time, the Lord gave me this passage. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Would you agree? Amen. Amen. Pastor Pat's gonna pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God. Thank you for Gail, Lord. We thank you for her life, Lord. Um, though we may be missing our pastor, she is missing her friend, uh, her helpmate, Lord, the one that she has spent most all of her life with. And we ask and pray, God, would you be her comfort? Would you be her strength? Would you be uh, her hope? Lord, we do thank you, Lord, each one of us pastors for our, our wives and, and the strength that Gail has been in teaching and ministering to the ladies here and to our wives. Lord, Pastor Steve, very faithful man, but Gail is, is even more so a faithful woman in standing and trusting you and believing all that you have done and worked through her heart and her life, Lord. We ask and pray, God, again, Lord, we thank you that... Uh, Though maybe 45 years ago or so, she opened her heart and received you as her Lord and Savior. And at that time, she asked you to be her husband, God. Um, Lord, now that her husband is with you, we ask and pray you would continue to be her husband, her strength, watching over her, guiding her, and keeping her, Lord. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to close with a song, but let's pray and then we'll sing. Lord Jesus, again, we glorify you. We honor you and we thank you, Lord. We'd have nothing without you. 
a home and a marriage and family, children, grandchildren, a church, pastor, and the body of Christ, wonderful friends. But Jesus, without you, we'd have none of it. Absolutely none of it. There'd be nothing. We'd be absolutely hopeless. But in you, Lord, what a wonderful thing it is to share a night like this and to look at what you do when somebody offers their heart and life to you. And Lord, how many of us have shared in it and blessed with it. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for it. And as we close tonight, may it be to your glory and your praise. In your wonderful name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And now, uh, I wrote this song a number of years ago uh, about the preacher rising up and talking about the love of Jesus. So this is for you, my friend. Set your sights on higher things. Prepare your praise to be given, yeah, to the highest king. Let your songs, let your songs rise up with power. 